So what I noticed with muscular growth was that I started putting on muscle much faster with much less work. And I mean like hospital grade because of how intense the burning was with the diarrhea. This right here is a lamb's heart. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? The erections were so strong that they were waking me up. Right? And that was, and I wasn't, not the piss thing either. <laughs> Yo, what's good my friends? It's Adam here and welcome to this carnivore diet review. For the entire month of January, I did the World Carnivore Month, thanks to Sean Baker, and others like Joe Rogan, Bell Brothers, Paul Saladino, and many more. What I thought I'd do in this video is just discuss my experience, what I'm gonna be doing moving forward. We'll start off with the things that sucked, we'll move forward with the things that I felt were tremendous benefits and positives, etc. And I'll give you guys a really good example of what I have been specifically eating. We're gonna talk about the different types of meat, the quality of meat, meal frequency, uh, digestive, of course, digestive things, uh, how I'm cooking my meat, what, what kind of oils, and if I am using you know, salt and all that type of stuff, and how specific organ meats as well. So we're gonna cover everything in this video, so buckle up. So I thought we would begin with the things that I thought sucked on this diet, the things that did not go so well, what I would consider to be negatives and drawbacks, because there's not that many. And when we get to the positives, it's going to seem like I'm an absolute zealot. So if, if we began that way, you probably wouldn't trust me. So I'm going to start with the things that were not so good. The volcanic diarrhea off the bat. And I mean like hospital grade, where I almost thought I needed to go to hospital at one stage because of how intense the burning was with the diarrhea. Now, I need to say one thing here for context. In Australia, January 1st, when World Carnivore Diet begins, it's not snowing down here. It is 40 degree heat, extreme temperatures and conditions, which of course, as you know, is not very good for diarrhea. So I feel like that played a part in why my diarrhea was so intense for the first five days or so. And of course, like just as others have described, it's, it's black, it's just liquid essentially, but it was very painful, like very, very painful. But it only happened, you know, it's maybe four or five times a day for the first couple days, then it simmered down, simmered down. Being 100% honest, the diarrhea didn't really stop until roughly day 25-ish. Like I, my body took quite some time to adjust and I feel that for two reasons. Number one, the heat, just the extreme heat. I feel like played a big role in why it took me a bit longer to adjust. But also part two, I didn't know about this off the get. I didn't know that if you're not used to taking in a lot of animal fat, that that can kind of, that impacts your, it's with the bile and the acid reabsorption and your small intestines ability to deal with it. When we shift the bacteria from a carbohydrate based, carbohydrate loving bacteria population to a protein, bile acid tolerant population, there's gonna be die off and that can create loose stool. And also the increased production of bile acids with lots of protein and fat is gonna create some catharsis in the gut. That is some increased motility, which can lead to loose stool until it adjusts. As I reduced my fat, animal fat intake and also rendered fat, I was starting off with duck fat and I took the duck fat out and I was just cooking my steaks by stripping the fat off and then cooking the meat in that what I found was that the diarrhea really calmed down and really quickly as well. I just didn't know that that was impacting it. So if I could go back right from the beginning, I wouldn't be using duck fat. I wouldn't be using beef tallow or beef sweat. I'll get to that in a second. I would just be cutting, stripping the fat off my meat, off my ribeyes, off my, uh, this is uh, wild water buffalo right here. I'd be stripping that fat off and cooking it in that and just reducing the amount of fat off the beginning. And that, that really helped with my diarrhea. So moving on to the second drawback, sleep. My sleep was very erratic. Normally I'm a very good sleeper. Normally I'll sleep from 9 p.m., 9.30 p.m. until 5.36. And maybe five out of seven days, that's just a straight eight, straight eight and a half, hour, eight and a half hours. And I very rarely would wake up during the middle of the night. But what I found over this carnivore kind of diet was that I was waking up roughly around 2 a.m very consistently to go drain the sea dragon. I just piss in liters. And I believe this is because your body is trying to piss out the excess urea. Uh, it's not used to dealing with it and the absorption rate's not there yet, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Could be wrong, of course. I'm not an expert. So but this is just what I've been listening to in other people's podcasts and reading up and researching. Now it's not every day. You know, some nights I'm good, some nights I'm not. And what I found was that the later I ate in the day, we'll talk about meal frequency later, 
the worse my sleep was. But if I bring it back and stop eating by 6 p.m., stop eating by seven at the latest, I had a much better chance of sleeping the entire night through. And uh, yeah, so the sleep is, was very erratic. I guess that's really it for the drawbacks. Uh, everything else is an absolute positive. It was just really the diarrhea and the sleep. Now, moving on to the positives. Where do we even begin? The number one positive that I experienced over 31 days of the carnivore diet challenge was the reduction of joint pain. I have been dealing with, I'm not even sure if you would classify it as arthritic, but just pain in my knees for all of 2019, uh, tendonitis in my elbows. Also throughout most of 2019, I battled with some pretty extreme spinal injuries in which that I lost a lot of neural connectivity, uh, particularly through my T-section, T to lower L-section, and in which basically I couldn't do a sit-up. When I was laying prone, I could get to here and then the lights go out of my spine and I just don't have any control over my core muscles there. It was an injury that I had at the beginning of 2019 flipping a tire. Oh. <laughs> yes. And then within days on the carnivore diet challenge, the, the strength of my spine and the reduction of just small pings and pangs in there and the connectivity was just coming back so much faster. And that, that's why it's number one for me that the fact that I'm not in daily pain walking with my knees, daily pain just picking things up, holding my phone just on the elbow, and uh, that I can that I can press things, and I'm just that to me is is incredible. It's really life changing. Now moving on to the second positive of the carnivore diet challenge, it's hard. There's like equals. There's a, they're very equal amongst each other. But if I had to choose, it would be the lack of battle with food choices. Listen, I've got some things here and I will give you more specifics on my diet. Previous to the carnivore diet challenge, I ate a very clean diet anyway, very, very paleo-esque. And no processed foods, no dairy, no processed sugar, none of that, no gluten. So that's the way I was eating before this. But it's still a battle. Like every time I would eat, it's like, have I had enough? Can I eat a little bit more? Am I gonna eat too much here? And especially at night. I was always very good during the morning, during the day, but it's at night that I want more almond butter. Almond butter and banana, you chuck, you heat that up over a pan, that's so delicious, but you just can't stop eating it. Macadamias, can't stop eating them, they're so Moorish. And there's always a psychological battle with me to have to exercise my willpower to stop eating. With this carnivore diet challenge, it's just not the case. I eat two times a day, uh, so maximum three times a day at the beginning of the challenge, but typically two times a day. But I'll just eat till I'm satiated, eat till I'm full, and then all the lights go off. It's like, I don't desire any more food once I'm done eating my steak, my eggs, my kangaroo, my water buffalo, fish, etc. There's no psychological test to see if you have enough willpower to stop eating. I never go to bed thinking, oh yeah, should I eat something more? Or could I eat something more? It, do it, it doesn't exist. So that alone, is probably why so many people are seeing such tremendous weight loss on the carnivore diet, because you can't really overeat. Now, of course you can if you went stupid about it, but if you're listening to your body, it's easy to stop eating and then to not have to think about food for until really ever. You never get hungry. I was never hungry on this diet. It's currently 12 o'clock right now. I haven't eaten since 6 p.m. last night. I've done an intense weight training session earlier this morning. And uh, so I'm delaying this meal because I wanted to film it, but I'm, I'm not starving. I'm not ravenous. I could, I, if you told me I'm not allowed to eat for the rest of the day, fast for another 24 hours, 48 hours, I'm good. 
I'm good. It's just the nutrient density of what's going on here and also my body learning to use its own body fat through ketosis. And moving on to the third positive that I found on this carnival diet challenge. And again, now they're not so hierarchical. These are all kind of alongside of each other, but the energy levels. Now, for someone who doesn't explore a lot of energy throughout the day, maybe you're just sitting on the desk, you're not doing much, you might not be able to relate to this as much. But for me, uh, it's all go. It's all go. Running my business, filming podcasts, uh, working with clients, Skype coaching, boot camps, etc. I require extreme amounts of energy throughout the day, and that's outside of my workouts. This is what really dawned on me though. I recently did a social Q&A live stream podcast, or I live stream it, and it went for two hours, 28 minutes. Now back in the day, I've done roughly 120, 130 podcasts split between the live streams and the Bottle Your Podcast, etc. And a few of them have gone above two hours. I've done a few two hours, but roughly around an average podcast goes for about an hour and a half to hour and 50. And that's solo, by the way. So that's just me talking straight. For the last five years I've been putting out podcasts doing this, by the end of it, I'm fucked. I am mentally drained when I get towards the end of a podcast. It's not necessarily because I'm run out of things to say. It's because my glycogen, my brain is depleted, that I've lost my spirit has gone somewhere. That's how it feels. But when I did this, when I did the first podcast on the carnivore diet challenge, which was actually just a few ago, I think it was like week two or week three. It was a two hour, 28 minute social Q and A live stream and podcast. And when I got to the end, I felt just as good as I did at the beginning. And I was like amazed. I didn't even realize until I thought about it. I'm like, I could keep going. I could. And to feel as good as you did at the start. Like I have just as much energy now as I did at the start. That's something amazing about this diet I'm finding right now, which of course I didn't know until just now because I haven't done a podcast in the last month. So insane, learning so much. Two hours and putting content out for two hours and a half. I had just as much energy at the end as I did at the beginning. That to me is like, that's astonishing. That is absolutely amazing to me. So kick. I think we're on number four now, moving to fourth positive. But again, these are all even now. The muscular growth and muscular recovery. <laughs> Meathead style. So what I noticed with muscular growth was that I started putting on muscle much faster with much less work. I didn't up my work. I wasn't doing anything more intense, but and strength as well that the strength, and I could take a lot more time off. You know, when I was coaching boot camp, I often wouldn't strength train for four days because I'm focused on my client, and but my strength wouldn't dip at all. Whereas previously, if I took four or five days off not doing deadlifts, not doing squats, I would notice I would drop a little bit of strength there. The muscular recovery is mind blowing, that instead of having to take two, three days off in between weight training sessions and strength sessions, I wanted to train the next day. I wake up feeling mentally that I want to train, but physically I'm ready which is I've never really experienced it. That's like some 16 year old shit. That's the last time I experienced that was when I was like 16 years old, where I could train every single day for, and the only time I was taking rest days, I'll typically just strength train five days a week, do some uh, Muay Thai boxing uh, one day in there. And so I'll typically take one day, you know, one day off every fifth day or so, or every sixth day, but not because I had to, just because I thought it's probably good, right? That I should probably just give my mind and my nervous system a bit of re relaxation. <laughs> Moving to the fifth positive I think we're on now, I'm losing track of this, but the libido. So the best way to describe the sexual potency increase is something that life's world saving. I described this on Instagram, shout out to Adelie Take One. I woke up almost every morning feeling like I'm ready to repopulate the world. If I was previous carnival diet challenge, waking up with a full mass that was had enough energy to carry me from Adelaide to Melbourne on a nice little boat ride, now I'm ready to go around the entire world. That it's the erections were so strong that they were waking me up, right? And that was and I wasn't not the piss thing either. Nani? Like I wasn't waking up because I needed to go over to tour. There was, I remember very early on, the first couple of days in Carbo Diet Charge, it was waking me up how strong my erections were. Sexual potency is real. Real this. So moving on to the specifics around what I actually ate. Typically kangaroo, wild game meats, and this time of year, wild game buffalo. Water buffalo right here. This thing is absolutely, oh, it's just, it just smells so fucking good, right? And the fat quality is so different as well. The fat's really sweet on this. So I try and eat as much game meat as possible because in Australia, we're very blessed with that, especially the kangaroo, which I'll get for you guys here. 
This is a typical thing. I've got this prepared because I'm going to eat straight after this. Is that this is a blend of what I'll do is I'll get my kangaroo mince, put it in here. I'll get some beef mince. It's got a little bit more fat content on it because kangaroo is basically 99% protein. So I get some beef mince that has a bit higher fat content. Put that in there. And then I also get my beef bone broth concentrate, which is Meadow and Marrow brand. It's 100% grass fed beef bones, 88% made of that. And then the only other thing in it is naturally evaporated sea salt. So there's no bullshit herbs and spices in this, which you finally, which you'll find you'll get in other uh, bone broth mixes. So this is really good. And I mix that in there, mix it all up, makes it taste really good. The reason why I do this with the bone broth is for the electrolytes. There's a whole bunch of sodium in this, but also there's very high in glycine, lysine and proline, and the collagen, of course, which people like to talk about. I really just like it for the flavor and the taste and the sodium though. I'll probably make up a mix of this, which is roughly 300 to 500 grams, depending how I'm feeling. And then I'll always pair it with a steak. Whether it's water buffalo like this, I might reverse sear this. So I put it in the oven on 100 for about 20 minutes. This is a sirloin. And then I'll sear them up real high after that. Oh, I've also got, well, I've also got here prepared because this is what I'm going to be eating straight after this meal is a straight after this meal, straight after this video. Why have I got it wrapped in paper? Because I'm absorbing the moisture. Helps to get a better sear. Uh, just porterhouse. Just regular porterhouse or scotch fillet. Right, grass fed, grass finished. My local butcher, shout out to my prospect. And right here, the beef fat. As I was talking about before, what I typically do is I'll cook my steaks in the beef fat. I just strip, strip it off the meat itself and cook it in this, great flavor, great taste, and you don't actually have to go and buy beef tallow, beef drippings. Every now and again, every few days, have a couple of these bad boys. I was starting off with just whole legs, maybe two or three I'd add in with a meal, but, and of course these are free range, pasture raised, uh, and definitely not caged. And it's really important with the eggs, hormonally. Uh, maybe once every third day, once every fourth day, what I found is that I just didn't need them. And then I eventually just over the last five days kind of just started separating the whites out and just eating the yolks because apparently the whites, uh, the protein can sometimes mess with you. And I just thought I'd try it out. I don't notice that much of a difference. I think I'm pretty good with eggs. I don't never had a problem with eggs, but there's those. And then of course this bad boy right here. Let's go right here is a beautiful, beautiful Atlantic salmon fillet. Generally speaking though, the only, I have to be honest with you, this is Atlantic salmon, not King salmon. However, I almost always buy Aura King salmon. And that's the shit that comes straight from New Zealand and it's uh, very uh, eco-friendly. The way they harvest and the way they grow their fish is eco-sustainable. There's the right words for it. But I would have this maybe once a week. And then as I got more adjusted to the fat content, I upped it up to two times a week. And I've always eaten fish and always been really good at it. I'm half Asian, I think it's in my genes. I think my ancestors ate a lot of it. Now, 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 let's move on to the organ meats, huh? So organ meats right here, I got a few for you. What you got right here is lamb's fry, AKA lamb's liver. Get that fresh from the butcher. This right here is a lamb's heart. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? It smells very sweet. It smells like grass, it smells like grass. You can see there's some, you can see the, the ventricular tubes down there where they would be. You can see the fat around the side. It's quite a beautiful thing. These are literally fresh from the butcher. He literally just cut them up this morning. And there you have your kidney. These taste absolutely terrible though. <laughs> so I said we'll talk about preparation methods. Beef tallow, this is from Tazzy Tallow. Again, not sponsored, but it's pure grass fed sweat dripping, which is basically rendered beef fat. So you imagine the fat that's on the side of this, they render it out, put it in here, very good. I need to put this back in the fridge soon as well. When I'm cooking my eggs, I'll cook my eggs in this if I don't have any uh, fat trimmings. This is very good for that. Uh, this is also very good just to pop on the barbecue if you want to barbecue steaks up. But again, I just strip the fat off my own meat. Um, I think when you get more adapted to eating the fat, I probably don't want to be doing that. I probably want to just consume the animal fat itself rather than cooking it using it for cooking oil. Found that this sit much better with my stomach than the duck fat did. Uh, with this pre-prepared thing, basically what I'll do is I'm gonna cast iron pan up there. I'll get that super hot, get some of this fat trimmings, whack that in the cast iron pan, put this mince mixture up in there, fry that up, that's good. Uh, take that out. And just a bit of a flash sear on my steak there when I strip it up like that, where just in using in the same pan, using the same juices from this, and I'll uh, get that up real hot. Just a couple seconds each side, I like it medium rare to rare. Now as for the organ meats, the way I prepare these is that, cause yeah, they do taste like ass. They're not, they're not that good, especially this one. Food process it, blend them all up, then get some beef mince, blend that in with it. If you want, you could probably blend some egg, some egg yolks in it. That would help with the taste. And also of course, 
Oh, this really helps with the taste. This thing just tastes like butter in a sense, in a sense the beef bone broth, and then just fry it up. That I found is a very good way to get your organ meats in without really feeling like I'm eating out of an animal's ass, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> if you're gonna be eating uh, gay meat, if you're gonna be doing, the way I do my steaks with gay meat is reverse sear. You must reverse sear. You're gonna do kangaroo fillet, you're gonna do water buffalo sirloin or ribeyes. All right, my friends, I have just reverse seared the fuck out of this wild water buffalo. So I'm gonna cut into this bad boy. It's what you call a ribeye right here. I'm just gonna slice one in. Oh yes. Ha <laughs> ha, that's beautiful. That is to perfection. Let me show you that right there. Oh dear lord. It's good. So that's what I'll do with my ribeyes. I'll cut this off, we'll chew that up, and then I'll slice this bad boy. Slice this bad boy nice and good. I just had the knife sharpened yesterday. So this is slicing like butter. Sorry if the uh, camera's bumping, but I'm very excited. I am very excited about this. Let me show you that. Now, in terms of liquids, just water. Just straight water, water and salt. Salt in my water, but I was doing that before anyway, just the electrolytes. Himalayan pink salt, it's very easy, very simple. You can get as fancy as you want with it. Now, you guys know I love tea, I love matcha, I'm about that matcha life. The secret to good conversation is almost like making a good cup of matcha. None, not at all. Not you know, some people did the World Carnivore Month kind of carnivore-ish, where they're still drinking wine, they're still drinking coffee. None. I, I was 100% only animal products. There was no paprika, there's no oregano, there's no coriander, there's nothing like that at all. No turmeric, just, just salt. No pepper, not even pepper. No olive oil, right? no mushrooms, none of that. No, just 100% carnivore. <laughs> What are my, what are my, what is my overall thoughts? My overall thoughts is that I've only just begun. I, my body's only really just adapted to it. You know, the first 30 days, my digestive system didn't really fully kind of adjust until, and it still hasn't to be honest. Like it's still, uh, it's still taking time. I'm still learning the ratio of fat to protein. I'm not, I'm not there yet with it. You know, it might, sometimes my bowel movements are really good, sometimes they're a little loose. I'm still working that out. My sleep is sometimes really good, sometimes it's not. So I'm working it out. And I'm a very curious guy. I want to experiment. I've experimented with everything. Uh, you want to talk keto, you want to talk paleo, you want to go vegetarian, you want to talk about vegan, I've done it all. And this by far has just been the simplest, the easiest, the best I've felt on out of all of them. And so with that being said, why wouldn't I continue and try and experiment a little bit more? Okay, so I'm gonna be doing this for the entire year. I've given, it's shown me more than enough reason that I need to give this the time of day. And I'm not saying I'm gonna be on it for life. I'm not gonna be that foolish. Uh, but what I will say is that I will update you regularly and we'll see where we are in a year. And, and I will continue to explore, right? Yeah? There's much to be learned here. There's very unknown territory, I don't know. And, and I, I'm not gonna address, and now a lot of you probably have questions about the fiber and the this and then that. And da, da. What I'd recommend is that you check out one of these three people, Dr. Sean Baker, Paul Saladino, or even Ken Berry. I think Dr. Ken Berry as well. But Paul Saladino has a lot of the scientific, to your scientific questions, check out Dr. Paul Saladino to just getting shit done and just, just getting on it. Sean Baker is probably the number one. And uh, those are the guys that I've been learning from and I've been diving deep on their podcasts as they've been talking to other physicians and doctors and having debates with other people as well. It's been very interesting. I have committed to an entire year of carnivore. I did the first month absolutely strict. Will I have some coconut ice cream and a bit of dark chocolate on my birthday? Uh, we'll see, we'll see. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, but I will be pretty much 100%, if not 99.99% carnivore for the rest of 2020 and we'll see how things go. So if you did enjoy this video, drop me a thumbs up down below. Uh, it helps me out, helps the channel out. Also, if you wanna drop me a comment with your insights, feedback, if you're gonna try this, right? Please don't be, a, don't, be a, don't be a dick. Don't be a dick in the comments, okay? If you're gonna comment, add some value for God's sake. And I just thank you guys for being along the journey with me. Uh, hit me up on Instagram at uitang1 to catch up on how I'm cooking things and my regular processing and all that type of stuff, my regular eatings. And I share a lot of that in my training as well. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe, tap the bell so you don't miss out on the videos. And with that being said, I wish you guys the best in your journey. Much peace and much joy.